Okay. One of the women. I don't think she was the only one. But you could say woman of the year. That works for me. Okay, we're ready? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world, or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Welcome as always to one and all. We want to begin by embracing all that you bring with you to our sanctuary today, all of your uniqueness, your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences, your differences, everything that helps make you who you are is welcome here this morning. This is so, as always, for those who hear me say this, is an important part of our time together on Sundays, but also for those of you who might be joining us for the first time this morning, you're equally as welcome and embraced. And of course, it is also true for those who are streaming with us this morning. So thanks to all of you for being here as well. Great to have you. I don't have any uh, announcements today that I know about. I'm not going to ask for any from the floor. <laughs> so why don't we just take a few extra minutes today to greet one another. As, as always, I hope you'll make some new friends. And if you are joining for us for the first time, try not to be too shy if you're on the shy side because we're very friendly bunch and we're grateful that you're here today.
Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have more opportunity after the service as we do each Sunday during our social hour for you to visit with one another. Let's move forward with our service now by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. Our opening words are a diversity of thought regarding individual conscience and freedom. From Jane Wagoner, see, the human mind is kind of like a pinata. When it breaks open, there's a lot of surprises inside. Once you get the pinata perspective, you see that losing your mind can be a peak experience. <laughs> From Walt Whitman, you shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. From the Gospel of St. Thomas in the Gnostic tradition attributed to Jesus of Nazareth. Some think, perhaps, that it is peace which I have come to cast upon the world. They do not know that it is dissension which I have come to cast upon the world. And finally, a Talmudic saying, a rabbi whose congregation does not want to drive him out of town isn't a rabbi. <laughs> and with those wonderful words, we're going to rise and sing When the Spirit Says Do, number 1024. Please rise, embody your spirit.
time for a story for all ages. Uh, the little ones and children, I see some, some who feel young at heart. Well, there are many people sitting here who feel like they're young at heart. And I appreciate the... Sorry, what's that? I appreciate uh, you coming here because you always, you are my helpers, right? Very nice, very nice. So, uh, you know, when I was like you uh, in elementary school, uh, my mother, a single parent, could not afford buying w warmer, like winter boots, you have winter sun, winter boots, um, for both my brother and me. And we had to share one pair. I wore the winter boots to school, in winter, of course. And my brother put them on after school to play outside. Well, one very cold, frosty day, a woman saw my brother walk through deep snow in sneakers. She said, why don't you wear something warmer? And my brother said, my feet never get cold. To avoid the embarrassment, my brother lied. See, if a person tells you an innocent, uh, the so-called white lie, do you call that person a liar? No, no. Oh, who is a liar then? You said, all the time. Who is a liar? The person who lies all the time. Wow, okay. So, do you remember the rhyme, liar, liar, pants on fire? Yeah. I found the origin of this rhyme. And that's what it says. A curious country boy um, stole a cigar from his father's smoke box and decided to try it like his father, and went to the uh, shed, tool shed. Well, as soon as he lit his cigar, the father smelled the smoke. He decided to find out where the smoke comes from. The boy, hearing the father's steps near the shed, quickly put the lit cigar back pants pocket here, and the father opened the door and said, what are you doing here? <gasps> the boy mumbled, I I'm looking for a fishing rod. At that time, lit cigar sparked into the flyer, and the father, fire, and the father yelled, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> his knee and whacked his behind to extinguish the fire. Well, some and others are willing to believe a falsehood. I remember an, a story, uh, actually about a crow. The crow was sitting in a tree holding its lunch, a piece of cheese it found somewhere. The fox was nearby. The fox smelled the cheese, saw the crow, approached the tree and said, Oh, I wish I had your shiny feathers and expressive eyes. With beauty like yours, you must possess a wonderful voice. Don't be shy. Please, sing for me. <laughs> the crow said, Oh! Guess what happened next? The cheese landed in front of the fox, and the fox grabbed it and ran away. So simple. <laughs> They're <a> bad crow. <laughs> there is a different story 
telling why some people don't want to know the truth. Once upon a time, there lived two sisters. Their names were Truth and Lie. Everybody loved Truth, who was direct and dependable. Lie, on the other hand, was deceptive and misleading. She thought、mm, there was no harm in lying. One hot summer day, the two sisters went to the river for a swim. They left their dresses on the bank. Lie was the first to get out of the water. She took the sister's dress, put it on, and left. Then Truth came out of the water, but she could not find her dress. What would you do in this situation? What? Go back to water? No. <laughs> Well, as the story goes, Truth preferred to stay undressed rather than wearing her sister's dress. Truth was afraid she would be taken for her sister lie. Then, as a result, now some people prefer a falsehood in disguise, since they feel uncomfortable looking at the naked truth. What will you choose to believe, a sweet deception or inconvenient truth? Ah, that's the question. Let's come to the chalice. Come, 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 come. <laughs> We light the second chalice so that as our children and youth go to their chapels, they carry the light of our flame with them. May it illuminate, inspire, and warm you as it does us. Today we have a special collection for Bite to Go. Notice you, in, when you came in with your order of service, there should be an envelope. So please put your contribution inside, but don't lick it. This special collection benefits the Bite to Go Fund and the students of Balboa Elementary. Your generous contribution will ensure that our students have enough to eat over the holiday break. As we work with the school to provide what is needed, please help to fill their holidays with fullness, love, and goodwill. So much. We'll now kindle our candles of care for those who are most 
on our hearts and minds this morning. And I want to begin with a candle for church member Joan Medina, who has been in ICU for the past five days. She was found in a diabetic coma and has a massive internal infection. Please keep her and her family in your thoughts. Also a candle for Pamela Comstock, who remains in rehab at Riverside after a recent fall. She is welcome now to having visitors. Uh, if you signed up for any of her auction items, uh, please give Phil a call, whose number is on that same sheet, uh, so that he can help arrange that. And then a candle for all the students, faculty, and family of those at Saugus High School in Santa Clarita, California, including the two students who died after that shooting there on Thursday. Also want to kindle a candle of congratulations and celebration for one of our church members, Susan Vernig, our board president, who was named a Woman of the Year by the Spokesman Review. So congratulations <laughs> to her. Susan has another meeting she has to be at today, but I'm, I'm glad to make that announcement for her. Let's take a moment of silence now, as always, on behalf of others that you might be thinking of this morning, and as always, you're welcome to name them aloud at this time, if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. Now is the time in our service for our meditation. Please find a comfortable, receptive posture and take a few deep breaths. I will share a poem and then we will hear a musical reflection from the choir. The Crossing by Ruth Moose. The snail at the edge of the road inches forward, a trim gray finger of a fellow in pinstripe suit. He's burdened by his house that has to follow where he goes. Every inch he pulls together all he is, all he owns, all he was given. The road is wide, but he is called by something that knows him.
Thank you all so much. It's beautiful as always. Thank you, Deb. I'm going to get right into my message this morning because uh, it's a little longer than usual. But I promise to have you out of here by dinner. <laughs> it's difficult for me to pinpoint when my controversial book, The Gadfly Papers, began. In some ways, I think it goes back to the first time one person tried to forcefully prevent someone else from honestly expressing themselves. It surely goes back to the first self-proclaimed gadfly, Socrates, who made a life out of asking challenging questions which eventually got him killed by the authorities. And it most certainly goes back to 1553 when Unitarianism's founder, Michael Servetus, was burned alive for questioning established church doctrine, his own heretical writings used to fuel the flames that took his life. It goes back to 1568 when Hungarian King John Sigismund passed the Edict of Torda, humanity's first religious toleration law, the first freedom of the pulpit law, guaranteeing that no one shall be reviled for his, by his religion for, for his religion by anyone, and it is not permitted that anyone should threaten anyone else by imprisonment or by removal from his post for his teaching. The Gadfly Papers also began in 1887 when the Spokane Unitarian Society was founded, adopting bylaws explicitly stating the authority of its belief is reason, the method of finding its belief is scientific. Its aim is to crush superstition and establish facts of religion. And its first principle is freedom of opinion and is subject to no censure for heresy. It began when this church called its first minister, Reverend Edwin Wheelock, who came with a bounty on his head, wanted dead or alive by the state of Virginia for preaching favorably of abolition. It began each time a heretical minister was welcomed into this pulpit, like John H. Dietrich, the father of religious humanism, who in 1911 became our minister immediately after being convicted of heresy by the Dutch Reformed Church. It began when his successor, M. M. Mangasarian, stepped into our pulpit author of the controversial book, The Truth About Jesus, declaring him but a myth. A few years later, I mean, I'm sorry, a few years earlier, in 1900, Mangasarian, founder of the Rationalist Movement, started the Independent Religious Society of Chicago, which had so much in common with Unitarianism that it joined the Western Unitarian Conference in 1922. That's right, American rationalism merged with American Unitarianism 41 years before the Unitarians and Universalists joined in 1961. My own heretical book had another starting point. Each time our congregation has upheld its founding principle of inviting rationalist, humanist, heretical ministers to occupy its pulpit like humanist Rudy Gilbert, our minister from the late 50s to the early 70s, who once said, freedom is, in theory and practice, basic to all other beliefs held by Unitarians, individually or in groups. A society, church, state, or political party may get a progressive idea or plan for the moment, but unless it incorporates the basic principle of freedom, it will sooner or later become an instrument of reaction. It also began when another of our humanist ministers, Reverend William H. Howe, immediately following in Gilbert's footsteps, dared to take on the federal government to prove the Hanford nuclear, nuclear reactor was leaking radiation. In a 1998 sermon, 
Reverend Howe pointed out that when, American Unitarian, when the American Unitarian Association was founded in 1825, the great majority of Unitarians generally accepted that reason, not emotion or sentiment, would be used to test all religious beliefs and practices. And I really appreciate the spirits of Rudy and Bill serendipitously butting in this week while I was writing my sermon. The Gadfly Papers began in 1980. Through the decade that followed, as I watched my former religious organization, the Southern Baptist Convention, go through what the Unitarian Universalist Association is going through today, the takeover of its institutions by authoritarianism and extremism. Just this week I received a communication from another UU minister who was a Southern Baptist during, the, during that takeover. Given our backgrounds, he said, I think we can appreciate more than many you use the dangerous road we're headed down. It feels all too familiar. It feels like the twilight zone. I find myself in agreement with much of the content of our current anti-racism talk, but the harsh, condemning, blaming, calling out tone of the white supremacy culture feels like I'm back in the Southern Baptist Convention. Most importantly, it began when I became an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister in 1999 and the minister of this church in 2011 when I was called here by you, which partly means upholding and protecting our liberal religious tradition by promoting reason, freedom of conscience, and our humanistic ethic, no matter who disapproves of it. So as far as I'm concerned, and so boldly standing up for our faith and the future of this church and our church, writing and distributing the Gadfly Papers was part of my responsibility as your minister. Indeed, I've been expressing my growing alarm over the abandonment of our traditional Unitarian values ever since I came here. You all remember those sermons, don't you? <laughs> what? Like in 2013, when I said, at some point during the past 50 years, we've come to define Unitarian Universalism mostly by its inclusivity, while often forgetting that we are primarily heretics, and that our openness and inclusivity is born of our heresy. In this sermon entitled A Tale of Two Heresies, 50 years of learning to keep our opinions to ourselves or not, I went on to say, and in the confusion of our identity, with a muddled, deluded, preposterous concoction of all faiths, Our tolerant religion seems more an idolatrous religion of tolerance. Too often we sacrifice reason and honesty upon the altar of this peculiar fetish in the holy name of not offending others. For tolerance in our age of political correctness has been spun on its head to mean we mustn't say anything that, anything that others might disagree with. Although ours is no longer a theocracy that outlaws and burns heretics, too many treat those they disagree with as if they are disagreeable. They blame those they don't wish to tolerate as if they are intolerant. 2013. I repeated this concern. What's that? Thank you. Gosh. I'm not giving any more sermons twice. <laughs> Finally, somebody who's been paying attention. So I repeated the concern many times over the years, including in my 2017 sermon, It's Not the Thought That Counts, in which I said, the culture of political correctness 
a philosophy of some social progressives who think nobody should get away with saying things they find offensive, a philosophy akin to that of people like Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, and Glenn Beck, who seem to think they have a right not to have to listen to the opinions they disagree with, that they have every right to publicly demonize, humiliate, and silence anyone who says something they don't like. And in my 2018 sermon, Protest and the Measure of All Things, I said, I disagree that it's okay to silence or drown out the speech of my adversaries. A tactic deployed alike by right-wing pundits on Fox News and progressive protesters on our streets and college campuses. To me, banishing one from my community, saying they don't belong, that they have no right to be seen or heard, is to protest their very existence, their right to live and be, which violates the law of love in every way. Some may recall the sermon I gave just prior to the 2017 General Assembly entitled, Chilled, PC, Misappropriation, Microaggressions, and Other Forms of Neo-Fascism. during which I broke down trying to explain tomorrow I will be heading to New Orleans to attend the Unitarian Universalist Association's annual meeting and I leave with a heavy heart. This was so I said because I had been part of the assembly's worship arts team, an endeavor that ended up being one of the most soulless and stifling experiences of my life. The hymns I wanted to use in the service I was responsible for were forbidden. Like one more step, because it's considered ableist by some. Or we'll build a land, because it might be offensive to Native Americans, even though it's based upon the Hebrew scripture. Come build a land where sisters and brothers anointed by God may then create peace, where justice shall roll down like waters in peace like an ever-flowing stream. Ban. It's when I also learned white males aren't allowed to discuss social justice issues on UUA stages because it's not possible for them to relate to injustice. But the most heartbreaking experience of all was when, after assigning the participants I had been instructed to include, I was told, your service is the whitest of them all. What can we do about that? I was dumbfounded and began listing the different ethnicities of the seven participants, only one of whom was a white male. Upon doing so, I explained in that sermon, I found myself becoming sick to my stomach, for I'm not accustomed to speaking of human beings in these terms as numbers and colors. Yet realized by making sure I had three African American participants and a Latino teenager that I had let this process cause me to tokenize others based upon their race. I allowed myself to go along to get along, demeaning the personhoods of others in the process. That's also when Let's Be Reasonable was born, the third essay in my controversial book, though the first written. The idea came against the backdrop of a hiring decision that resulted in widespread accusations that the Unitarian Universalist Association is white supremacist organization, which the UUA leadership then took for granted and is for all practical purpose all the assembly focused on even though it was occurring 
but a few months past Trump's election. And many of us had additional concerns, that one included, as well as global warming, we wished had also been addressed. I reasoned because Unitarian Universalists claim, as is written in our associational bylaws, that reason is one of our major sources of inspiration to help us avoid idolatries of mind and spirit. That by modeling the use, its use in response to this difficult issue, we might use it to be more honest and understanding and compassionate with each other. Not very reasonable of me to presume, I can tell you. I got that one really wrong. You can imagine my shock when within 24 hours of giving my book away, a letter signed by over 300 of my colleagues condemning my book, stating zealous commitment to logic and reason over all forms of knowing is one of the foundational stones of white supremacy culture. And when two months later the UU Ministers Association censured me similarly claiming we cannot ignore the fact that logic has often been employed in white supremacy culture to stifle dissent, minimize expression of harm, and to require those who suffer to prove the harm by the culture's standards. Although I don't disagree with some of this and would encourage you to read Ibram X. Kendi's remarkable 500-year history of white supremacy stamped from the beginning for solid examples of how logic as well as science and philosophy have been used to uphold racist beliefs. The UUMA's letter of censure gave no examples of how my logic has done so. I suppose having no commitment to using reason its emotionally reactive members don't recognize the most common fallacy in their thinking, affirming the consequence. To understand that, read my book. It's like saying that all rainbows contain the color purple, the bouquet contains the color purple, therefore the bouquet is a rainbow. Using logic isn't necessarily racist any more than using ships or roadways is racist, even though both were used in the slave trade. What's not to be missed, however, more so than the unsoundness of this surprising claim that any use of logic is a form of racism, is that we now have two historic documents in existence, one signed by hundreds of UU ministers and the other a letter of censure from the UU Ministers Association, both explicitly renouncing the use of reason, that which our associational bylaws still list as a source of our spiritual growth. And that the founders of our own congregation established as the authority of its belief, and I'm at war with Unitarianism? The essay placed first in my book, The Coddling of the Unitarian Universalist Mind, was inspired by a 2018 book of similar title by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, critiquing safetyism. The belief ideas can be harmful and are therefore dangerous, and it is our moral obligation to protect others from hearing things they disagree with, sometimes violently, but always by sacrificing free speech. No wonder the minister's letter of refutation also makes the astonishing claim that freedom of speech itself is now to be considered a form of oppression. When I read Codling, I realized that it described what it described happening on college campuses these days in the name of protecting students from harmful ideas is precisely what I see going on in the UUA. And I won't go into my essay's content now, but I will mention some of the questions I hope its content provokes if we ever get around to actually talking about the contents of my book instead of all the red herrings and straw men 
and non sequiturs, those are logical terms. For instance, are all the white males in our congregations, the little ones, the older ones, and all those all over the world for that matter, really, really the embodiment of white supremacy and patriarchy as the UUA now seems to consider? If so, were they destined to be so before they were born? The moment of conception when their genetics aligned? At birth? Was it kindergarten when they began being enculturated? What is the age of accountability for this new original sin? Are their mere images really so offensive that we are not to even allow their pictures to appear in our publications or, pr or promotional materials? Is it true they can't empathize with others or understand injustice? And what of the use of language as metaphor? If we can no longer use stand, as in standing on the side of love, or blinded, what of words like see, and hear, and walk? Is let it be a dance we do, now among the band hymns in our hymnal? What's next? Who decides? Who will let us know? I heard of one greeter at the General Assembly here in Spokane, an older volunteer who was called out simply for using the word welcome. Accused of implying those she greeted needed her welcome because they weren't welcome to begin with. Must we now be afraid to speak to each other for fear of harming someone with the smallest unintentional slight? Must we fear even saying, welcome? Is the use of reason, once fundamental to Unitarianism, really become anathema to our association? Is truth really culturally relevant? Is there nothing objective about it? Is truth private and personal? Does tolerance mean not saying things others disagree with, or does it still mean having the ability to hear things that we disagree with? I can tell you if the new definition of safety means never hearing things we disagree with, then nobody is safe in this church as long as I am its minister. <laughs> Nor anywhere else in the world for that matter. The second chapter of my book I want a divorce, a case for splitting the Unitarian Universalist Association. Speaks of the identity crisis I believe has plagued us ever since the merger of Unitarians and Universalists in 1961. As I point out earlier in the book, humanism like reason and freedom has always been foundational to the Unitarian side of our tradition. Beginning with the earliest Unitarians, who may have been theist, but they held a humanistic Christology. That is a belief that Jesus was only human. Just five years after the 1961 merger, the new association surveyed its members to identify their typical profile. Of the 12,000 members surveyed from 800 congregations, 
Less than 3% claim to believe in a supernatural being. 28% considered God an irrelevant concept. 57% did not consider theirs a Christian religion, and 52% preferred a distinctive humanistic religion. When a similar study occurred more recently in 2005, UUA members no longer had a clue what our religion is about. One claimed it's, it's the support network. Another saw the UU movement as an interreligious dialogue. Another said it's comprised of people who didn't fit in anywhere else. <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> While others complain its members share little in common. This is where the UUA falls down, one said, and why you have cups and the Buddhists and the Christians and all these little subgroups because we offer the hope of a spiritual journey yet we have no tools to do it with. The report on the survey concluded, despite consensus within the church that the liberal message of Unitarian Universalism is important in this troubled world, we find it difficult to articulate that message clearly. This identity crisis in our religion I argue, is the result of unresolved tensions between Unitarianism and Universalism going back to the beginning. In his previously mentioned 1998 sermon, The Struggle for the Soul of Our Movement, Reverend Bill Howe said that we can view this as a power struggle for dominance, or we can view it as an opportunity to come up with a new and more creative synthesis. I hope so. I really do. Things do not have to go back to the way they were for those who are streaming this. They don't. I'm not saying that. But let's go forward together. He also warned that we never forget that humanism's emphasis on human experience and rationality is essential to living in a sane world. Emotional experience and religious enthusiasm are essential to a moral and rich world, but divorced from reason, they easily run amok, leading to error and even barbarism. This is, in my opinion, what's happening now. The complete abandonment of our traditional Unitarian principles, freedom, reason, and the humanistic ethic. Consider this, during a 2012 UU ministerial conference, keynote speaker Reverend Frederick Muir referred to the trinity of errors he believed is stymieing our religion. A persistent, pervasive, disturbing, and disruptive commitment to individualism. Unitarian Universalist exceptionalism that is often insulting to others and undermines our good news and our allergy to authority and power. Muir goes on to say we need to establish something that has eluded Unitarian Universalism, a doctrine of the church. Feeling comfortable yet? <laughs> that we cannot do both covenant and individualism. that we must move beyond the concept of an I church, that the four pillars of the new church doctrine must be multiculturalism, environmental justice, sexual and family values, and right relationships, and that Unitarianism's humanistic turn has arrested our theological creativity. Humanistic turn, you know, from back in the beginning of Unitarianism. In a 2019 UU World article entitled The Power of We, just prior to the recent General Assembly, our association's current president cited Muir's trinity of errors, individualism, exceptionalism, and our allergy to authority. 
repeating his blueprint forward that we need to move from an I church to beloved community, from individualism to interdependence. More recently in October, a Pacific Northwest UU region newsletter was sent out with an article further promoting the shift in our congregations from I to we. And I think all three articles make some good points and were well-meaning, but they also create a false dichotomy that there is either I or we, either the individual or the community, when both must exist for human beings and societies to be healthy. Without the strong commitment to individuality, that is our heritage. We easily succumb to the kind of groupthink and fascism overtaking our entire nation today, which is why UU leaders disparaging exceptionalism and anti-authoritarianism trouble me. If we see e equality as meaning that we must all think and speak and act alike without any exceptions, because that's what exceptionalism is, without freedom, we end up like the former USSR where everyone is equally as miserable. And it is only by eliminating individualism without exception, as the UUA is now suggesting, that authoritarianism can thrive. If this is what Unitarian Universalism now means, I cannot be part of it because I consider individualism, exceptionalism, and our aversion to authority our strengths not our errors. <laughs> Last year, prior to my book, another UU minister wrote a Facebook post stating in part, I have reservations about current UU racial justice ideology and would like to find a place to discuss them with colleagues of all races. I can't imagine that our moderators would allow such a discussion here. Can anyone suggest a place? Here, yeah. how about here? Well, for this, for this, he too was censured by the UU Ministers Association, also accusing him of violating our covenant and code of conduct. I knew because of the cancel culture now amuck in the UUA, there was no way that I could openly talk about my concerns either, or get permission to give my book away, not that I needed it. So here I am now, the hero of a story to some, and its villain to others. I hope it's worth it when the story ends. As I see it, our turmoil religion now has three options. We can continue down the course we're on, watching our traditional Unitarian values evaporate into oblivion. We can split, as I say in my book, may be inevitable if we're not allowed to talk about these concerns. Or, this one's way out there. Or we can have genuine, respectful, open dialogue about what's going on and figure out a way to move forward together. Maintaining our common values and shared goals, including the goals of ending racism and all forms of oppression everywhere. We all want that. Don't say we don't. Because we disagree with you. Don't do it. I'm going to end this longer than usual sermon as Bill Howe ended his 1998 sermon about this mounting conflict he saw even then. Maybe this time around we can have a continuing and creative dialogue instead of a divisive and destructive struggle for dominance. But 
We need to keep the dialogue open and civil, and we need to get started pronto. Thank you. We're closing with our hymn today. It's number 145, As Tranquil Streams. It actually affirms some of those older Unitarian values that Bill, uh, that uh, <laughs> Todd was talking about, and Bill. <laughs> um, and I find it refreshingly forward-looking. Number 145, As Tranquil Streams. benediction is from the poet Rumi. Be a lamp or a lifeboat or a ladder. Amen. Blessed be. Salam alaikum and shalom. <laughs>